Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast. If you like what you hear, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy it. I'm so excited to discuss my sponsor today, which is Page One Books, because my summer book bundle is ready on pageonebooks.com. And the bundle that I've put together includes three books that I picked, uh, Montauk by Nicola Harrison, More Myself by Alicia Keys, and I Miss You When I Blink by Mary Laura Philpott, all of which have been on this podcast here. Uh, It includes a Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books beach tote, a cute little library card pencil slash cosmetic case, and a water bottle for staying hydrated plus a little... um, thing of sun lotion. So go to page1books.com, page one with the number one. So page number one books.com and check out my page one books summer bundle. Buy it as a gift, a housewarming, if you actually go somewhere or just give it to yourself. Everybody needs a treat. We've had a long spring. <laughs> page one books.com. This is day five, the last day of this week for my July book blast. And today is Fiction Friday. I'll be releasing a few episodes of novels that I think are pretty awesome and can't wait to introduce you to these authors. I'm doing the July Book Blast because I interviewed a lot of people during quarantine and the books came out during quarantine and I would love them to get the airtime they need now to get the word out. Also, a lot of these books are great beach reads and if you have any time this summer, I would love for you to hear more from these authors directly. So please enjoy Fiction Friday and stay tuned. This whole week was Memoir Monday, Debut Tuesday, Beach Reads Wednesday, Thrilling Thursday, and now today, Fiction Friday. I hope you've had a chance to listen to a few this week and enjoy this one. Bye. Beatrice Williams is the New York Times, USA Today, and internationally best-selling author of The Golden Hour, The Summer Wives, The Secret Life of Violet Grant, A Hundred Summers, and several other works of historical fiction, including her latest book, The Last Flight. She is the screenwriter for the television adaptation of The Summer Wives, which is currently in development with John Wells Productions. A graduate of Stanford University with an MBA in finance from Columbia University, Beatrice worked as a communications and corporate strategy consultant in New York and London before she turned her attention to writing novels that combine her passion for history with obsessive devotion to voice and characterization. Beatrice's books have won numerous awards, have been translated into more than a dozen languages, and appear regularly in bestseller lists around the world. Born in Seattle, Washington, Beatrice now lives near the Connecticut shore with her husband and four children, where she divides her time between writing and laundry. Welcome, Beatrice. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. So you have such an interesting background for an author, having gotten yeah. your MBA and all that. And I actually got an MBA too. I wanted to talk to you a little about that and how your sort of traditional sort of more consultant strategy type brain morphed and now started writing all this fiction. So uh, okay. tell me about that. It's actually the other way around. Oh, no way. I okay, was sorry. somebody who never wanted to do anything but write books. What was I doing in the business world, getting an MBA, finance and all that? I mean, I think it does help. My father's an engineer. So I was never that kind of writer who like is allergic to numbers and science. I always love numbers and science. And in fact, a couple of my books have dealt with science issues. In The Secret Life of Violet Grant, I was sort of in the world of, of physics you know, in pre-war Germany. And in actually my, my current book that's coming out, uh, Her Last Flight, deals with early aviation. And of course, I'm not you know, going into long technical explanations, but that whole process fascinates me and, and the science of flight and, you know, sort of the various things that pilots would have to do in the age before GPS and sophisticated instruments to figure out where they were on the face of the earth. This is all very fascinating to me. But, you know, my, my, my love has always been literature and writing. I always wanted to do that. And I think I was just scared, you know, partly because, you know, my father, he's British and having grown up in a post-war rationing, Britain sort of really wanted to have me do something practical with my life. So, you know, I went to college and I actually majored in anthropology, which he was very proud. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it was more like trying to get a liberal arts education and, and wanting to kind of square that circle. How do I find a way to make a living and yet write? You know, writing, it's very, it's, you do have to have a lot of guts or else just an enormous amount of unjustified self-confidence. It's, you're putting yourself out into the world kind of naked and, you know, people will judge you. They will say things to you that your boss would never say to you in a normal job, you know, and, and you just have to take it. You're not even allowed to 
respond back to criticism. So, you know, so you do have to go in there with a certain amount of, of courage. As my father would say, many are called, few are chosen. You know, what if this thing that was supposed to be my big talent all my life, what if I'm not actually good at it? You know, so I had all these fears. And so I went into and also going to a college where people were very success oriented. You know, if you, there was no point in doing anything if you were, unless you're going to be wildly successful. So, you know, I went into the business world, Wall Street, a lot, believe it or not, a lot easier to succeed on Wall Street than to succeed in publishing. And, and, and then I got married, had kids, um, was home with the kids. And I thought, okay, this is the moment for me to actually do what I really want to do with my life, which was to write. So I started taking classes and sort of learning the more technical side of writing and storytelling in particular, and eventually got to the point where I felt I had something other people might actually want to read. That's amazing. I love that story. Thank you. <laughs> it's always story of fear overcome. <laughs> it's true. No, it always, it really, I feel like it, it really informs the reading when you know what, where the author's coming from and how you had to keep coming back to that passion of yours. And I don't know, I think it's really always nice to hear. So I, I sometimes, you know, I had this enormous burst of creativity when I first started writing and, and you see, I have so many books and I even have a pen name I was writing under so additional books there. And it was partly because it was just, I had so much inside me, all this like pent up decades of stories that I wanted to tell. And you know, now, you know, that kind of has slowed down a bit for me. And I'm, I think I'm a little more measured about my books and the, just the sentences and everything that goes into them. There's a complexity there. But, you know, maybe the, you know, that, that initial freshness, that burst of huge creativity, it's definitely transitioning for me into something more nuanced and thoughtful. And, you know, I, I think the books are getting more complicated and, and not quite the sense of a, you know, an ending that's, that's obvious and pat. And, you know, if if you're somebody who doesn't like ambiguous ending, yeah, I'm starting to kind of transition into that where, you know, just that sense of ambiguity to me is so fascinating because it's, it's just so much of what we encounter in real life. And I read you said somewhere that even though you write a lot of historical fiction, it's really just the people in those moments. It's not the history itself that draws you to the stories. Tell me a little more about that. Well, I'm obsessed with history. I have just from my childhood and and my, you know, my parents, we were out there in suburban Seattle, but here are my parents, you know, we would go to the Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, Oregon every year. That was our family vacation. Everyone else got to go to the beach. I was watching Shakespeare plays and, and we had season tickets to the Seattle Opera, which was actually quite, certainly at the time, and I think even now, very innovative opera house. They had a really dynamic company there. So, you know, but opera is historical fiction. I mean, they were doing historical fiction and Shakespeare was doing historical fiction even in his own time. And so to me, the past has always been a window into the present. And the best way to understand what is going on today is to understand what happened in the past. But to me, again, it's not, and I go here, I go back to Verdi again. It was Verdi who said facts are not important, which is heresy right now. If you're a historical fiction writer, facts are obviously important. You want to create that verisimilitude. But what is more important, because people can disagree about the facts and the interpretation of the facts, to me, what is important is understanding how people lived and breathed and talked and ate and and encountered the world around them in a particular historical era. So I will do everything I can to make sure that the facts are right, or if I need to sort of bend a few dates and so on for the purposes of storytelling, I will try to make it very clear in my author's note. But to me, you know, it, it, it's not the facts, I mean, you can read facts in nonfiction and, and there are some amazing nonfiction writers who do it brilliantly. What you're coming to with fiction is the human story and what it is like, you know, to exist within a certain historical environment. And what we learn is like, not just that, well, these people are the same as us, but that also history is repeating itself. We are so often in the same, making the same choices or, or, or I guess faced with the same impossible sometimes choices that we were in the past. How do we get through that? How do we square human nature with, you know, the, the sort of sense of civilization and learning to become better human beings? You know, that to me, that's kind of the core of my project as, as a historical fiction author. And tell me a little more about her last flight. 
So her last flight kind of goes back to, an, you know, I keep talking about my dad, you know, it, it sounds like, but I mean, he really did have an enormous influence on me as a child. And he actually was a pilot back in his college days until they figured out he's actually colorblind. But he was, yeah, he was flying with, they call it the University Air Squadron, which is sort of like uh, in the UK, it's what, you know, sort of like the ROTC for, you know, pilots going into the RAF. So I always had this sort of, you know, just a background of aviation going on in the household, loved to fly and had read some books that were set in that period. So I, I'm fascinated by it and particularly by the pilots. I mean, your chances of dying were so high. Uh, so I wanted to write a book about a female pilot. My initial prompt was the Amelia Earhart mystery, which of course is one of the most fascinating mysteries in recent human history. What happened to her? I sort of posed a what if, and then I kind of went off and did research and realized that she was not the only fascinating female pilot out there. She just had a really good publicist who happened to be her husband. So that's kind of one part of the story. A female pilot who has a really good publicist for a husband and is not quite sure that this is the life she wants to lead. She wants to fly. And all this other stuff going on to her gets in the way of sort of the purity, the beauty of flight. But the story is actually told through the eyes of another character, a photojournalist, or Reary. She has been taking photographs on the in the European battlefield in the in the Second World War. She was there during the trials of Nuremberg. So she's at a moment in her life when she really wants to find something worthwhile, and she goes in search of actually the pilot who had been this Irene Foster, her flying partner, who also disappeared around the same time. So she goes all the way to Hawaii. She follows clues. Uh, and ends up in Hawaii and discovers a woman who's living there who she thinks is actually Irene Foster, the vanished pilot. That's actually the starting point of the story. So we go back and forth between Irene's story, which is told as excerpts of a biography written by our photojournalist, Janie Everett, many years later. So we hear Irene's story through Janie's eyes. And then we hear Janie's story as she slowly starts to unpeel the layers and we start to realize why she's been so obsessed with these pilots and their disappearance. Ah, <laughs> that's a great, I mean, that's, just, that's like the best sell, right? That's like, yeah, I just realized in the middle of it that I haven't actually done the sell speech yet. So I was really making it up as I went along. I hope it wasn't too convoluted there. No, it's I, great. I, I hate, I'm sorry. I always put people on the spot, but I like to hear what people come up with. <laughs> discovering the mystery, you know, behind what happened to this person. And, you know, and it's, it's not Amelia. I certainly borrow some biographical details from Amelia Earhart because she is a fascinating person, but so much is woven in there, all these other pilots. And just to me, that sense of God, the, the courage it took to get out there and fly back then, whether you were man or woman, the odds were good. You were going to crash and die. What kind of person does that? Why do they do it? What's driving them? Where are these people today, by the way? You know, what are they doing now? This, this type of person. So to me, the, the psychology of it is so fascinating, particularly when you're telling it, you know, and, and, and sort of I use that device of the biography, excerpts from a biography, because I kind of wanted to tell that story a little bit from the outside in, trying to understand this person as a public figure, but also so the private figure behind that public figure. So it was really kind of a, you know, and I wrote that part first, the biography first. So I kind of knew Janie before I started writing her actual story on the page. So that was a really interesting process as well. How I, you know, created a voice for a character that we hadn't actually met yet, because of course the biography is inevitably in Janie's voice, not that of Irene. So I'm always trying to kind of challenge myself a bit in terms of storytelling technique. And, and this was certainly a fascinating challenge for me to get into. I was like, I was trying to understand two different women at the same time. But I think that adds a certain layer to the story. And you kind of find out why as we get towards the end and the mysteries start revealing themselves. What does this process look like? Like, do you use note cards? Is it spread out all over? Is it all in your head? Like, what? Wh like, where do you do all this work? It's in your head? I have a notebook, and I scribble things down in the notebook. But I don't do... 
I know, you know, and, and there's this sort of the classic debate between the plotters and the pantsers. The pantsers, you know, plot by the seat of their pants. They make it up as they go along. I kind of do a little of both. I have a kind of a, I know where I want to go. This is one book where I kind of knew what the twist was going to be going in, which was good because it's kind of essential to the story. But, you know, I, I kind of visualize it in my head almost as like kind of a three-dimensional piece of architecture. And I, I can see the scaffolding, but I can't see all the sort of the layers and the the cladding and, and everything that, that goes on top. So, you know, gradually, you know, everything gets kind of, you, you have this bare bones and then you just keep adding flesh onto it and flesh onto it until it becomes a real thing. But I, I am linear. Uh, in fact, I'm so linear. That's why I write you know, that sort of piece that takes place in the past first. And then I layer the other piece, the sort of the mystery hunting piece of it on top, because I need to know what happens from beginning to end. You know, the actual mystery taking place. I need to know the solution. I need to know how it happens. I need to know who these people are before I can send my sleuth, you know, on the hunt and picking it apart. So I know a lot of writers who do the dual narrative go back and forth, write back and forth, even as it's written. I'm so incredibly linear that I have to do it, you know, literally from one beginning to end and then start the other one beginning to end. So, but everyone's got a process. So uh, everyone's astonished when I say that's how I do it. And I just literally cannot imagine (laughs) writing it any other way. So you're clearly like super smart. (laughs) And in fact, as an aside, I think one of the smartest things you did was decide to write to co-author books with two of your good friends so that you could travel together on press tours. The best idea ever. And, and, And it is breaking our hearts right now that we can't get together. We're usually together two or three times a year. And it's so much fun because we need to plot out our next book. So we're, we're managing to do it by Zoom, but it's not the same. So Yes, it did start out as sort of, you know, very much wanting to spend more time with each other, but also really loving each other's talents and getting together and creating stories together is just the most incredibly creative process ever because there's there's three of us, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, we like to say it's like three brains in one body. When we're really tired, we accidentally say that it's one brain in three bodies, but that's a completely different scenario. And, 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 but just that, that sort of, you know, I think the challenge with plotting on your own is that you don't know what you don't know. You can't foresee the problems that lie ahead. So suddenly you realize you, you've written yourself into a corner and you've got to kind of go back and, and sort of rework something. When it's three of you, you know, you've got everybody sort of picking apart all the ideas as we go along so that by the time we finish plotting something out, and, and in this case, we do actually plot the whole thing out very carefully before we start writing, we're able to sort of troubleshoot and foresee all these, you know, these problems before we get to them in the writing. So I love doing it because it's just a much more efficient process than using one singular feeble brain <laughs> that needs a considerable amount <laughs> of caffeination in order to work properly. So. <laughs> So you've written so many books. As you mentioned, you also have written a ton of historical romance and all these and mystery. Like how many books have you written in total? You know what? I, I kind of stopped counting because I mean, so that I, re- I wrote some books as Juliana Gray. So there were two romance trilogies. And then I moved into more sort of historical mystery. And there's two. So there's two of those plus a novella that connects so I like to have my worlds all sort of be the same. So there's a novella that kind of connects the romance to the historical mysteries. So I guess that's six, seven, eight plus a novella. And I kind of left some threads dangling in historical mystery number two. So I would like to get back to that at some point. And then, of course, we have now written three books as Willig, White, and Williams. And then I think her last flight is my 12th book as Beatrice Williams. Amazing. I have to, I count it up. I literally kind of count it by, because, you know, after a while, it's, it's not that I don't want to count. It's just that it doesn't matter to me. You know, I, I, I don't sort of, it's not something I kind of keep a tally board, how many books I've written or how many words I've written. It's really, you know, the stories and some of them connect and some of them are a little more standalone. I have three books that literally were sort of a sequence. They're not exactly 
a trilogy because they're three different women, but they're sisters. And so the stories kind of flow a little bit into each other. So that's the most connected books. But then I've got my Wicked City series as well, which is a definite series, Wicked City, Wicked Redhead. And, you know, the next one is still in my head. So I kind of tend to see the books that way rather than, you know, oh, I've written my 12th book. Uh, I sort of have to literally count them up when we do the biography for the book jacket and be like, okay, how many is that? So what does writing do for you? Like, what do you get out of it? You know, it's a little bit like what I hope my readers get out of it when they're reading, which is not so much escape as just immersion in a different world. I think that when I'm writing well, I'm writing fast. I'm writing in that sort of flow state that we all try to get to when we're writing, which is just a total immersion in a story. And that is what keeps me going through the harder bits when it's just not working and I need to sort of figure out why it's not working and kind of get these characters where I know them well enough that everything that happens to them just seems preordained. So it is really that process, I think, getting myself into that flow state and creating that world that is what motivates me, what gets me, you know, in front of my laptop every day. You know, I I think that I don't want to sort of make this sound magical, but I think that to a certain extent, it's just you have a kind of a story, you know, maybe just the way some people are born mathematicians. They have a knack for mathematics and they see something more in mathematics than we do. You know, they see the story that is in mathematics. They see the truth that is inside the numbers, you know, like when you're laboriously graphing out, you know, what an an equation, you're graphing an equation. And and sort of, so these numbers actually mean something real and tangible. They translate into things, right? So I, I think that you're somebody who instinctively feels that or not. And I think with storytelling, you're somebody who, when I write a story, it's like the words on the page or maybe 10% of the story that is in my head, all the details of a person's life and personality and so on. It's really just kind of distilling that. And so I think a part of that is just innate. I think, you know, our DNA kind of gives us certain jobs that we're good at because that's what I was here. Here's the anthropology major speaking here. Uh, Because we need storytellers, we need mathematicians, we need inventors, we need We even need a couple of sociopaths to sort of make the tough choices that the tough moral choices that we don't want to make, you know, so that I think that's why whatever five to 10 percent of the population is, you know, is technically psychopath. I think we kind of need them in some way. We just have to channel that evil energy into (laughs) into good. You know, so I think that's kind of what my role is in the hunter gatherer group. I'm the one who, you know, we're by the campfire. It's nighttime. We need to process and understand what's happened to us today or the past few weeks. And so you spin a story that helps people come to terms with what has happened and who they are and sort of just, you know, literally put that to bed. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Read, you know, definitely read, but read widely, you know, read, uh, you know, I was, I'm, I'm on deadline right now, but I do try to get some fiction in, in the evening. And I finally started The Secret History, Donna Tartt's The Secret History. And I'm just, maybe it's just because my brain is so occupied during the day. Cause I'm also, by the way, running a and b for, I've got four kids at home, including Three of them are teenagers. One's like almost 12 years old, plus my husband and all these pets and everything. I, I'm literally, I don't know these people who are like, lockdown is so boring. I'm like, are you kidding? I am on my feet all day long. And then I get these little pockets of time to write in. So I was trying to read and it's just, I was like, you know what? I need to read something kind of more fun right now. So my lovely friend, Eloisa James, you know, wrote her latest, and I haven't read a his, you know, historical romance in actually quite a while. So I was just like, you know, I'm just going to read something that is fun and engaging and romantic. And, and she always delivers. And so I started reading it last night and I felt so much better. But, you know, the, I actually learned a lot from, from romance authors. I mean, they're just good storytellers. They know instinctively what certain elements of human relationships are irresistible to us and also how to tell a story to keep the reader engaged on the page. So I would say read everything, romance, mystery, you know, literary fiction, classics, you know, books that were, I I find reading novels that were written in the period that I'm writing about are just so much more useful than many other sources. And you get the feeling and the rhythm of human interaction and storytelling. So read all you can and 
we spend so much time worrying about the words. I feel like the words come when the story is there. Uh, you need to think about what is the story you're trying to tell and why would people be interested in this story? Anyone, you know, other than you yourself. So those are kind of my two pieces of advice. Read all you can and really think of yourself as a storyteller. Worry about the writing later. The writing obviously comes with the editing. You know, focus on the story. Think about why it is you're telling this story and why it's important and why people would care. It's great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your life experience and your technique and all the rest of it. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I, like I said, I've been sitting in front of my laptop. So talking to somebody outside my family is just a really exciting moment for me right now. So I appreciate it. <laughs> I agree. I'm glad we got this to work. And giving me the yeah. <laughs> and by the way, like you, I have four kids and I like loved how you said that you write like while you're not doing laundry, because I feel like I do laundry all day, every day. It's like, that's what I do. So <laughs> I am, and I've got a load right up there now. As soon as I'm done here, I have to go put that in the dryer yeah. and make sure, you know, the right stuff is hung up. I could, I could hand it off to somebody with my clothes. I, I just don't trust anybody else with the laundry. No, me neither. Yeah. Anyway. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Hang in there. <laughs> yes, you too. Send me any laundry tips. Uh, we will get through. This. <laughs> yes. I love the microphone, by the way. I need a microphone like Thank that. Thank you. Blue Yeti. That is very good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a great day. Thanks All again. Right, thanks so okay. much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks so much to listening to Fiction Friday, part of the July Book Blast of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I hope that you found some really great reads this week. All five days I've launched tons of episodes so that I can entertain you and you can connect with stories and just feel a little better in the world knowing that these stories exist and that these authors are out there. So I hope you enjoyed all of these Fiction Friday episodes and that you had a great day and I hope you have a really great weekend and come back next week because I'm doing one more week, one more five days, I should say, of another July book blast week and I'll have five new fun days then and then back to normal. But anyway, you can have a little like binge podcast fest or something. <laughs> anyway, have a great weekend. Thanks again for listening to my podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you liked this episode, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and sign up for my mailing list at zibbyowens.com so you can always hear about the latest things I'm up to. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much to Page One Books for sponsoring today's episode. I hope you'll all check out my summer beach bundle at pageonebooks.com. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. Thank you.